Let's talk about engagement. What the hell is engagement? Engagement is where everything grows. What's our job in business? Our job is to add more what? Win, once in a while or every time. If you do it for decades, you become a brand. If you become a brand, people will bend down on one knee, reach behind other things to buy Coca-Cola. Even though very often when you do studies, and they've done in the past, some of their competing brands seem to have a better taste test result. People don't give a shit, give me the Coke. Because <laughs> it gives them certainty. Because it becomes part of their identity, right? So our job is to engage people. And if we look at engagement, involvement, passion, connection, massive focus on how to do more for the client than anybody else, what, how are we doing that? How are we doing? Well, most of us pat ourselves on the back, but throw up the statistics. This is scary and crazy, and it shows you why economies around the world are where they are right now. According to the Gallup poll, which was done in 142 countries, intensive, 13% of employees worldwide are truly engaged at work, meaning they're passionately connected to the sense of mission, the value, and when they're at work, they're trying to maximize their time for the benefit of that mission. That means, by the way, 87% are not engaged. Now, it's better in the United States. We're better than anywhere else in the world. We have the highest engagement, a whole 29%. Think about that. That means 71% of US workers are disengaged. That's pretty crazy. Does that make you crazy? And I know it's true. You know, I went did, when I went on this last book tour, I did 110 interviews. It's crazy, the most I'd ever done. And so I was going all around, and I won't mention the companies, but I was going to all the media companies, and I walked into these buildings. I got 31 companies. I, I have very passionate values about how we play the game of life, right? And I walked through these buildings, and the world, because we're so technology-driven, it's so dead, but I'm walking around watching people on their personal Facebook, tweeting, doing all this stuff, and the energy is so low because there's no mission. And you look around and go, how do these companies survive? And if you look at our economy, our productivity has dropped. Everything else dropped because now we're so distracted because we have so few companies that have that mission connection today. And the ones that do, they dominate, completely dominate in that process. Now, what should really concern you is the next statistic. 24% are actively disengaged. What does that mean? It means they have no passion for their work, they lack any motivation to get the job done, they're unhappy, and they're likely to attack the company. If you're trying to grow your business, and one quarter of them are trying to screw you over that work for you, that are your partners, how many know people like this in your own business? Come on, raise your hand if you know them. Nice and high, raise your hand if you look around the room. Clearly, Donald Trump has at least one of those and sent his taxes to the New York Times. Right? Somebody was actively disengaged at the Trump Organization, sent his tax returns, and kind of gave him a whole nother challenge for him to deal with once again, because he didn't have enough before this. That's how bad it is. Now, here's what's great. The companies that do have engagement have an unbelievable competitive advantage. You name, what are some of the companies that have the most engaged employees? Instead of me telling you, you tell me, tell me. And they're already putting it out there, thank you so much. Your timing is wonderful. We put Salesforce, do they have you engaged, yes or no? What other company gets a convention of 100,000 people to come and spend time for days, throws the best parties with you two, gives you the best technology, and you want to come back? How many have come back here more than once to this Dreamforce? Let me see your show of hands. That's called engagement, but the employees at Salesforce engaged. Because Mark started out with a vision from the very beginning. We're both into contribution. In the very beginning, he said, tell him we'll do this one, one, one plan that now Google uses, right? 1% of our stock, 1% of our profits, 1% of our time. I'm sure he'll go over the newest statistics in his, well, his talk tomorrow, so I won't say a word and steal that from his company, his ideas, but I'm impressed, and I'm sure you will be too. Google, Starbucks, Zappos, you name it. Tony Robbins, somebody, but that's not, that's not, a, that's, oh, that's the slide of Tony Robbins. Okay, I'll get that. <laughs> They're trying to put us with Salesforce. We're not in that, that realm. Not yet, anyway. So the point is, what these companies have is an advantage. Here are the statistics that the study showed. Throw them up there real quick for us, if you would. One of the things you see immediately when you look at these companies are 20% higher profitability on average, 10% higher customer ratings, 28% less theft, 48% fewer safety incidents. I'll tell you what else they found. Nearly two times greater satisfaction at work, 1.7 to be exact. And they're three times more likely to stay. How important is that to a company's sustainability? 
right? Today, the average cost, if you lose a sales executive, it costs you a million dollars in business. It'll take 12 months before you were back to the same level to replace that person, all because you didn't fully engage. So how do we get people to engage? We get them to engage, because think about this. How can you get us to engage if you're not fully engaged? And how many of us have been guilty of getting overwhelmed, stressed, frustrated, whatever, and not being fully engaged? Who's been there before? Even in this room of engaged people, raise your hand and say, I. So if we, the hungry, driven ones, can let this happen to ourselves, you can know what's happening with everybody else that's not as driven as you are in this area. So it is a challenge to say the least. How do we solve that challenge? Well, you can't move someone if you're not moved. You can't touch someone if you're not touched. And that's why what we're here to do today, what I want to talk about in a few moments, may be the most important thing of all. And that is making sure that you are fully engaged in a way that produces the maximum results that you want. So rather than me tell you, if I tell you to be me telling you, here's what I want you to do. Stand up just for a second, real fast. Stand up, shake your body out, shake it out just for a second, shake it out, shake it out, and put yourself in a group of three people as fast as you can. If you've got a notebook with you, you're welcome to do it, but go grab three people real fast. And one of you grab a notebook or a phone or an iPad or something. And what I'd like to do, all three of you raise your right index finger towards the ceiling in your group, all three of you. Okay, point to the leader of your group now. <laughs> Whoever's got the most fingers, you're it. If you all pointed at yourselves, we know a little bit about your group. <laughs> okay, so here's what, leader, here's what I want you to do. I want you, in fact, just sit down first for just a moment. Now you know who your group is. In a moment, you're gonna jump back up with your group. I want you to write down the answer to a question. Throw up on the screen for me the questions real quick. I want you to write down an honest answer as to how engaged are you to your maximum capability? How would you rate your level of engagement with the people you lead and manage on a scale from one to 10? 10 is absolutely off the charts, mind boggling, they blow your mind. One is, that I got a dead group of people, right? And what do you need to improve? What do you need to improve to increase that engagement? Instead of me telling you, you tell me, you tell each other. And the third question is, what specifically do you need to do to engage your people at a different level? What could you do? Because we're going to share this because then you get some ideas from the other two people as well. And finally, what do you do? What, what do you do a less than adequate job engaging? What could you do better with that person? In other words, think of someone you're not good at engaging. If you're good at engaging everybody, how many have a problem child? Someone who does not maximize their resources within your team. Raise your hand if you got somebody like that. Good. Then I want you to write down that person and ask yourself, instead of they're screwed up, what can I do? Where, where am I not engaging? How can I engage them more? So five quick questions, and then I'm going to put you with your team. Body out, shake it out, wake it up. Give me your score. How many of you were a perfect 10 in your engagement as a leader? Raise your hand. Okay. One liar. Good. Very nice. How many were a nine? Raise your hand if you gave yourself a nine. Who was an eight? Okay, now I want you to look. 90% of this room, maybe 95, is below an eight on a zero to 10 scale. By your judgment, not mine, I'm not so judgmental of you as you are. And if you're below an eight, how could you possibly maximize your resources? Much less enjoy yourself because, listen, when you don't give your all, I remember I, I, I got a chance to interview Coach John Wooden. Anybody remember who John Wooden is? Greatest basketball coach in history of the world, college basketball won 11 national championships, 88 games in a row. And it wasn't like the Bulls with Michael Jordan. Every year was new players. It's college. And I remember he taught me something. He said, Tony, I asked him which one was his team that he was most proud of. And I know a little bit about basketball. I'm old enough to remember Lou Alcindor, Jabbar, Abdul Jabbar, people like that. I thought that was going to be the group for sure. The winning his team. That was not the team he picked. He picked the team I'd never heard of. And I said, why that team? They didn't perform as high as... These other teams, why would you pick them as the greatest team you ever worked with? He said, Tony, because they maximized their abilities. He said, you know what? He taught anyone ever worked or was coached by Coach Wooden, he taught people really something simple. He taught them how to be great men. And the way he did it was he said, it's really simple. Stop thinking about the score of the game and focus on one thing you can control, how much you give every moment you're on that court. He said, there are going to be days when you win and when you lose. But the only days you're going to know when you win or lose are going to be by your measurement of yourself. If you, every single moment you're on that court, you're engaged at level 10 or above, if such a thing were to exist, 
and you gave every ounce of yourself every minute on the court, then it doesn't matter what the score is, you won. Because you became more and you gave more. And in life, we don't get to keep anything except what we give. Because that's what makes us become something different. His entire mindset, by the way, was if you give your all every single moment on the court, and every one of us does, if all of us are 100% engaged, he said 99% of the time you're going to the highest score. Sometimes someone's going to get lucky, they'll get a different call, the ball will drop. But you can't control that. You can control you. So if you're below an eight, which most of this room is, it might be time to change. And maybe that's what I felt when I walked in this room and the energy was lower. It's like, it's not a judgment. It's just, I want you to have the enjoyment that comes at 10. How many can remember a time where you were so engaged in something that bombs could be going off? You would know you were like right there in the zone. Nothing else could distract you. Who's ever been in that place? Say, I. Make a sound of how it feels when you're in that state. Make a sound. Go for it. Now, make the sound of level seven engagement. And then imagine doing that every day. So then you want to find some new technology that will get you excited again. And the technology is only as good as our engagement. Who's with me on this? Say I. I. So now I want to ask you real fast, round robin, while you're standing with your group, what makes someone engaging? What makes someone disengaging? Make a list. You have one minute. Go. Together. Do it together. Don't sit down. Do it together. Somebody tell me, give me an example of two things that make them engaging, two or three make them engaging, two or three make them disengaging. Anyone, raise your hand. Let me grab somebody. We'll grab a microphone. How about, yes, sir, right here. Give him a hand. Uh, name's Poncho. I'm from San Luis Obispo. Great. Tell us three things that make somebody, make you want to engage with them. Tell us three things that make you want to disengage or not be involved with them. Yeah, so engagement, uh, positivity, uh, level-headed, mission-oriented. Okay. Uh, disengaging, unappreciative, grumpy, and unjust. Very nice. Give him a hand. Very nice. Somebody right. T- tell us three things that make people engaging. Tell us three things that make you not want to engage in them or disengage. Uh, empathy, drive, and positivity. Okay. Disengage would be lazy, mean, and somebody that has the worst case scenario attitude. Very nice. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Tell us. And we came up with one person. Three things for someone to be engaging would be drive, positivity, and openness. Great. Um, disengaging would be victim, low energy, and a me, not we attitude. Give her a hand. Thank you very much. Let's see what you do inside yourself to turn on engagement to turn it off. Now, human emotion is energy in motion. That means if you want to change how you feel, you can do it by how you move. If you try to do it with your head, you can go in circles, can't you? rationalize, go in the nut. So I want you to try something real fast. We're going to do a real simple exercise. I want you to discover how you can change your own engagement and your own interaction with people by seeing what you do in your body when you go to engage someone. And I'm going to give you some deliberate scenarios. We're going to do three real fast. Number one, when I say now, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to as many people as possible as you can in two minutes. When you do that, I want you to introduce yourself to people you don't know, but I want you to do it from a different emotional state. I want you to do it as if you think this is the stupidest exercise in the world and it's a waste of your time. And why do you have to talk to this idiotic person? In other words, you're not going to say it, but I want you to walk up to them like it's a total waste of your time. Hi, how you doing? You're going to shake their hand like, 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 you know, you, sir, come here. You, come here. Come here. What's your name? What? A- Adrian? Adrian. <laughs> Deliberately walk up and be in a state where you really think it's a waste of your time. I don't have to talk to this person, but you're going to do it anyway. And I want you to notice, listen, notice what you do to be in that state in your body. What do you do with your face? What do you do with your breathing? What do you do with your posture? Do you go straight towards them or do you hesitate? I want you to notice not only how it feels to be greeted that way, that'll be obvious. I want you to notice what you got to do to be in a state where you disengage with someone like, it's a waste of your time. Get to as many people as you can in a minute and a half. And notice what you do. By the way, you're going to be in a state where you don't want to do this. You're just doing it because you have to. Go. Okay, stop wherever you are in the room. Freeze. Freeze where you are in the room. Now, it wasn't hard for some of you to freeze because you didn't go anywhere. went, hi, hi, I'm done. <laughs> now, how many of you couldn't help yourself? You're like, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> I saw a few of you out there. How many actually did it? How many actually did it? Raise your hand if you really did it. Say hi. So, I want you to yell out the answer because we have about, what, 7,000 people in this room, and they're from all over the world. So it's a great test ground for human beings. Raise your hand if you had to change your body to go in this lousy state. In some way, raise your hand if you had to change your body. Say, I. 
Raise your hand and say I if you change the muscles in your face to get in this little annoyed state. Say I. I. Uh, tell me, did you, did you increase your breathing more full or more shallow in this state? Shallow. Nice and loud. Which one? Shallow. Which one? Shallow. Did you talk louder or quieter? Quiet. Which one? Quiet. Which one? Quiet. Did you talk faster or slower in this state? Slower. Which one? Kind of like the room when I walked in here. And I want you to get this. There are 7,000 people here from, what, 100 plus countries? And you're all saying the exact same thing. And I didn't tell you those things. You're telling me because in order to go in that crappy state, that's what you all have to do. If you use your body that way, you're going to feel lousy no matter who you're around. And many of us don't. We think it's other people, and it's the state we put ourselves in. So there's a pattern here that's pretty universal, isn't there? So let's try something. Shake that out of your body. Get out of that state. And let's try a totally different state this time. This time, I want you to do this like you're a little kid. If you do it like an adult, you're like, why are we doing this stupid exercise? <laughs> but if you're a kid, you have fun with stuff. Who's going to have some fun with this? Say, I. Ah. Awesome. And here's what I want you to do. In a moment, I want you to introduce yourself to as many people, different people again. But this time, I want you to do it from a state where you're deathly afraid they're going to reject you. Okay? Now, don't tell me you know. Who's ever not done something because you're afraid of being rejected or failing? Raise your hand. Say, I. I. So wouldn't it be useful to know what you do to put yourself in that place? Because if we know what it is, we can what? Change it. Because it's in your body. It's not just in your head. And when you know the pattern, you can change it. So I want you, when you do this, to exaggerate your fear. Do you know why? Because achievers never get fearful. We just get stressed. And stress is the achiever word for fear, isn't it? If I follow the trail of stress, it'll bring me to your deepest fear. And the fear we all have is I might fail and then it means I'm not enough. And if I'm not enough, I won't be loved. Those are the deepest fears that people have inside their head. I want you to do this. I want you to imagine really like a little kid shows their fears. Adults like, I'm not afraid. <laughs> Make this tension in their face, right, their body. I want you to just really go for it. It's kind of like, you know, like if I came up and said, hi. What's your name? Hey, Bob. How you, how you doing? <laughs> Give her a hand. It's Evolve, ladies and gentlemen. Give her a hand. It's kind of like how many of you in this room have ever watched, like, let's say, the Olympics, the Winter Olympics on television? And you're sitting in your chair and you're watching someone skiing or snowboarding as you're sitting yourself and you're something this. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say hi. I want you to exaggerate so you see what you're doing on a more subtle level. Just one minute, as many people as you can, but like a little kid, you're deathly afraid. And I want you to see, what do you do different with your face, your shoulders, your breath, your voice, the way you shake hands? And let's see if it's different or the same as when you're really annoyed. I think you're gonna find it's quite different. Ready, go. Take your body out, get out of that state. Question, did you use your body the same or different than when you're pissed off and annoyed? Which one? Yes. Raise your hand if you change the muscles in your face in a very different way than when you're annoyed. Raise your hand. Say, I. Did you talk louder or quieter than when you're pissed off? Faster or slower? Yes. Did you go straight for him or hesitate? Did you breathe more full or even more shallow than when you're annoyed? Which one? Can you hear everyone saying the same thing? What are the chances of 7,000 people from 100 countries without direction saying they're feeling the exact same thing in their body when they're feeling the emotion. It's because we're all unique, but when you use your body one way, you're gonna be pissed off. You use another way, you're gonna be feeling fearful. And if, how fast can we change how we feel then if all we gotta do is change our movement? How fast? Like that. Let's take one more. Shake your body out, okay? This time, how many of you own your own business? Let me see your hands. How many of you are leaders of the business? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are parents? Raise your hand. How many of you have a relationship? Check this out, a relationship with a human, with a human. <laughs> then this shit's gonna work for you. Here's what I want you to do. When I say now, I want you to greet people, but we're gonna change the motivation because I hate the word motivation. I've never been a motivator, but I do believe motive does matter. If your motive is just to manipulate, most of us have pretty giant bullshit meters and we can figure that out at this stage, can't we? I mean, even reality television is bullshit. So we know what's true. How many know what I'm talking about here? Say, I. So the motive change is gonna be this. I want you to approach somebody and greet people and meet people in two minutes, but 
but we're going to have a different understanding. If this person does not like you in the first three to five seconds of meeting you, they don't like you in the first three to five seconds of meeting you, they are not going to do business with you, and your children are not going to eat next week. <laughs> or just in case you don't have kids, we'll do it this way. If they don't like you in the first three to five seconds, then everyone you care about dies like pigs in hell. <laughs> if it was that important, I bet you use your body and face differently, wouldn't you? So, by the way, when you go to do this, I'm talking full tilt like it really is true. And let's see if you use your face, your voice, and your body differently. Ready? Go. If that felt better, say I. I. Say I. I. Question, did you use more of your body or less of your body? More. More muscles in your face or less? More. More voice, louder voice or quieter? More. Faster or slower than the other two we did? Yes. Did you hesitate or go straight for them? Yes. Did you touch them? Yes. Did it feel good? Why? You should have seen who I touched. <laughs> no. Because emotion is created by motion. In other words, listen to me. If you use more of the gifts your creator has given you, you will experience the gifts you think you're looking for somewhat. Everything you want, everything you want to feel is already inside you, my friends. Was that the, how many feel very different right now than when we began? Raise your hand if you feel much better than when we began. Raise your hand, say ah! Yeah. Say ah! Yeah. Question, that last greeting you just gave. By the way, do people ever judge, people would never judge someone in real life in the first three to five seconds of meeting them, would they? <laughs> Was that the best greeting you're capable of giving a stranger? Yes or no? Yes or no? Is that the best greeting you're capable of giving a stranger? Yes or no? Quick. How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, the majority are saying no. Now, if you're saying no, let's review the assignment, shall we? We said if you don't give your best, then everyone you care about dies like pigs in hell and you still didn't give your best? We need to talk. You know what? If you said you didn't give your best, I actually respect you. Because what we all know in our souls is, whenever we think we've given our best, what do we always find out? There's always another what? Is it true? So let's go there one final time. You go, what are we going to do, get naked? No, no, no. Here's what you're going to do. This time, I want you to greet somebody like they're your long-lost lover or best friend. Like, oh my God, it's Susie. Move, there she is. Oh my God, I see her. There she is. Oh, wow. How are you? Wow. So good to see you. So good to see you. I want you to greet people like your long lost best friend or lover. One, two, three, go! or less? More. More oxygen or less? More. Did you talk louder or quieter? Louder. Faster or slower? Faster. Did you hesitate or go straight for them? Did you touch them? Yes. Did it feel good? Yes. Why? Oh shit, you already forgot. <laughs> because emotion is created by... Is there greater engagement right now, yes or no? Yes. Do you enjoy yourself more or less than where we began? and I did nothing, you just decided to engage. In this state, would you be able to engage others, yes or no? Yes. What if they don't want to engage? Come here, you little bastard, I'm gonna hug you. <laughs> you go, I can't go, there's the president of IBM, Charlie! <laughs> I bet it'll change their state. <laughs> how many feel the difference in how you feel right now? Say, I. I. Then don't let this go, and the only way you can do that is if you start to measure. See, we can't manage something we don't measure, you know that. But how often do you measure your state? And yet this is where all engagement comes from. Because if you're not fully engaged, how can you ever expect other people to be? Mark is fully engaged. Agree or disagree? Agree. That's why you're all here. So you must have some respect for this man. I sure do. If you do, you can handle it, right? But see, successful people do what the failures won't. If you do what everybody else does, we know what that is. Come to work with a good state, intending to work hard, 
positive intent. Most people don't come to work to screw off. And you have the best intent, but you're tired. See, I am full of mercury. I'll explain in a moment. That's why I'm sweating so much. I sweat anyway, but I've got mercury poisoning. That's why my body's shaking. But I'm here to give you a million percent. I'll do a million percent, and I've done that for 39 years every day of my life. That's why I have a brand. You can have a brand too, but you have to measure. You have to say, where am I zero to 10? And if I'm a frickin' below nine, what am I doing with my life? In an intimate relationship, where are you zero to 10 in your engagement? If that's below nine, you have no passion. You might have love, but you don't have passion. If you're below a seven, you're probably friends. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can have a friend and not be married to them. It's a very different game. I'm suggesting to you that this is the most important element of life because what's going to make you feel alive is engagement and you're in control of it. How fast can you change your emotional state, your engagement? How fast can you change it, my friends? How fast? By a radical change in your body, you can do it this quick. Try something right now. Make a crazy sound of excitement. Just make a sound. Go, make the sound. Try another one. Try another one. How many of you used to make crazy sounds when you're a kid for no good reason until people told you to shut up? And you know what? You let yourself become conditioned into what society has taught us to be to be appropriate, and what that's cost you is spirit. It's cost you the flow. And when you look at the people that you're most entertained by, if you look at, when you watch YouTube, if you watch a business person like Mark, who you really feel moves you, it's because they do what nobody else does, because they put themselves in stay. He doesn't feel like it every day any more than I do. But he still does it every day. You know why? He does it enough until it becomes him. It's like an athlete. You build muscle. There's emotional muscle. What's more important than emotional muscles? They are the spiritual experience of life. What's more important than courage? Courage unused, what happens to it? If you don't engage your courage enough, if you don't engage it over and over again, what's going to happen to it? Grow or shrink? Which one? Faith uninvested. What happens to faith that you don't actively use? It dwindles. Passion unexpressed. Does it grow or shrink, my friends? Which one? And everything you want in your life, you can have if you have the resources of these emotions, but these emotions come from being in a peak state. So whether I'm working with presidents of countries, of which I've worked with many, royalty, athletes, the best performers in the world, entertainers, they're all geniuses of this. And I get the phone call because they want to go to the next level because they're already great, but they won't settle because they're always looking to be more. Because they know a 2% difference like this, you take out a week from now, you know, 10 degree difference, a month from now, six months from now, you have a different life. Or people come see me when they have a challenge. They're either the best in the world or they're challenged. They got a birthday with a zero on it right? They lost their job or they built their company, they sold it for $500 million and now they're bored and they want to figure out what to do. People suddenly, when they get hungry is when they look for answers. I don't deal with people who aren't hungry. They think I'm an idiot, I'm some positive thinking guy because they're never going to investigate the truth. They don't want it. But who comes to me is somebody who's hungry. And what we want to do is fan our hunger, but tie to that a new simple discipline. Where am I zero to 10? And if you're below an eight, you're hurting who? yourself. You're hurting your family. You're hurting your business. You're, you're part of that group, even though you probably never identify with that group that's not engaged because you're more engaged than they are, I know. But you're not engaged at the level that you deserve. Who's with me here? Say, I. This is what engagement feels like. Now, if you'll sit down, before you do, I would like you to get three crazy hugs and then grab a seat. And we're going to give you one last piece here that's really important. Now I'd like to give you what I really came for. How many have enjoyed what you've gotten so far here? Say, aye. aye. Good. My mission is to share something else with you. And I think that you're going to find this may be the most important part of why you came here without even knowing it. And it's simply based on this. I'm totally committed to helping people. My mission is help people live an extraordinary quality of life. What is an extraordinary quality of life? It's life on your terms. Not mine. It's not my view. What is it you want most? What would your ideal life look like? How would you live? What would you do? What would you share? What would your impact be? And most people have not spent much time thinking about that for a long time because they've been so disappointed. Everybody as a kid thinks this way. 
And then gradually we have enough disappointments, frustrations, sometimes betrayals from people we care about that we get gun shy and all of a sudden people start going, I'm pessimistic, I'm skeptical. Let's be honest, you're being gutless. It takes no guts to be skeptical. It takes no guts to be pessimistic. It takes no guts to go on the internet where no one knows who you are and write shit about people so you can make yourself feel good by having the illusion you made someone smaller. So you have the illusion you're moving up. And our society is filled with that. So extraordinary life is life on your terms. What would an extraordinary life look like for you? And my bet is most of you have an extraordinary life, but how many of you know how great your life is? How many still want more? Raise your hand if you want more, say I. How many want more love, more joy, more success, more freedom? How many want all these things? Say I. I. Then whatever success is for you, some people extraordinary life looks like three beautiful children. Some people extraordinary life is a billion dollar company. Some people's extraordinary life is writing poetry. Some people's extraordinary life is working the Tenderloin District, helping those people, not just feeding them, but loving them. Everyone's discovered what an extraordinary life is for them. And if you know what it is, that's the first step. Then you need two master skills. Please jot them down. These two skills are what will give you that life. The first skill is the science of achievement. The science of achievement is that whatever you want to achieve, there are rules, and if you follow the rules, you can win the game. So for example, if we talk about our bodies, it's a science to be vitally healthy, to be strong, meaning there are rules. Everyone here is biochemically unique, but are there some universal rules that if you violate them, you're gonna have low energy or disease in your body, yes or no? Yes. You bet you will. Are there a set of rules that if you align by them, you're gonna have an abundance of energy and a vital level of health, yes or no? Yes. So I don't care what you believe, if you jump off a cliff, you are going to drop. I don't care what you believe, if you violate the science of your health, you're gonna have problems. The same thing is true financially. I spent four years, now it's been six, interviewing some of the most brilliant financial minds literally in the world. Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, Ray Dalio. And by the way, one of them I just mentioned, you probably didn't know the name of. How many of you know who Ray Dalio is? Look at this room, 7,000 people, only a couple dozen. The richest people in the world all know who Ray Dalio is. Ray Dalio, you can throw it on the screen, has produced more returns for investors than anyone alive, including Warren Buffett. Everyone talks about Warren Buffett, but Ray Dalio is the guy. Ray's interesting, amazing man. This guy, when I interviewed him, he was, is a man who is the largest hedge fund in the world. Rich people give their money to hedge funds. And when they give it to hedge funds, a big hedge fund might be like 15 billion, raise $165 billion. 10 times bigger than anybody else. When I interviewed him that day, the prime minister of China, the head of China, called, interrupted our call for coaching about what to do with the currency. This is the level. This is a man, to give you an idea, who's produced a 23% compounded return for 21 consecutive years. Think about what all the ups and downs, the bear markets, bull markets, all that stuff. Total genius. You don't know him because you probably couldn't get access to him, to give you an idea. But I got access. It's been a fan of mine, it turned out for 20 years, which is really helpful. And I went in for a 45 minute interview, and as my nature, I go deep, and four hours later, three and a half hours, I left. And one of the most important questions I asked him was this, because I wanted to write this book, and I wanted to give people, anyone, somebody who's a billionaire, or somebody just starting the journey, somebody who's a baby boomer, thinks they can never get free, or somebody like just got out of college, millennial going, how do I ever get out of debt? I wanna be able to help all those people. And by the way, I donated all the profits of that book, $5 million in advance before it even came out so we could feed 100 million people. That was not 100 million, I had to write some more checks, but it got me started, right? So I asked him, I said, what, what if you couldn't give any of your money to your children and you could only give them a set of principles, a distinctions, a scientific plan, a strategy that would cause them to be financially free what would it be? He said, Tony, and I asked this to every one of these 50 multi-billionaire investors. They all had great answers. His was the best. He said, Tony, I have spent 15 years of my life obsessed with that question. He said, because not only do I want to take care of my kids, but I also have all these charities that when I die, I want those people to continue to be helped. And he said, I have an organization of 1,500 people who work around the clock to come up with the best ideas and they all compete with each other. It's a very, very tough place. This place called Bridgewater where he runs this operation. It's very unique. And it's dog eat dog competition to come up with the best stuff. And he goes, I know I won't be here for that. And he said, I also know that markets are always changing. And he said, I noticed something. Everybody tells you what to do financially 
and they say diversify, and they tell you to put this much in bonds and this much in stocks, and that's supposed to protect you. And he said, no one talks about the dirty little secret, which is when the markets drop, like 2008, 2000, it all goes down. But no one says anything about it because eventually it comes back, and then the same people sold you other things, go, well, that's just the market. We don't know what to do, and they do the same thing again, and it happens again. And people can lose half of all they earn overnight, right? So he said, I want to find a sustainable solution. And he, I'm not going to tell you the details here. That's why I gave you the book, because I want you to have this for yourself. But the bottom line is he laid out this plan. And he's well known for putting together this thing called an all-weather portfolio. All-weather means he doesn't know where the market's going to go. The smartest people in the world are not the ones on CNBC telling you where the market's going to go, because no one knows. The smartest people in the world, every one of them told me, I don't know. Here's what I think, and I'm going to be wrong lots of times. So I diversify and put together a portfolio that will win no matter what. His has been the most successful. And so I asked him to explain it to me, and he did in detail. Now, I did 18 hours of prep for this one interview with him, and he said on the air multiple times that there's no one that's interviewed and been more prepared for an interview than I. He and I pitched and catch, and because of that, I got to this final level where he explained it to me. And I said, you know what? You just told me the most important set of principles to financial freedom that anyone has ever shared that I'm aware of in the world. He goes, well, that's true. <laughs> he was not, you didn't disagree with me on it. And I said, but there's only one problem. You said, here's how you bake a cake. Use some sugar, use some chocolate, use some dairy products. I said, but you didn't tell me the amounts. He goes, Tony, I can't give you that. That's my secret sauce. He goes, you have to have a $5 billion net worth and you have to give me a hundred million minimum to start or I don't even talk to you and I haven't taken money for 10 years. I said, that's my point. You're not gonna give anybody this anymore. You've closed your fund. You're running it for the people you're running it for. And you just untold me that if someone goes to the average advisor, they're good people. But this is a poker game where only the best in the world win at the financial level. Unless your financial advisor is won a bunch of gold medals, he told me, you're screwed. Because it's only a matter of time until there's a real problem. I said, you're the ultimate gold medalist in the whole world, and you know the answer. And I said, you're a totally generous man. You're going to give away half your net worth. I said, why don't you help people right now? Give me the formula. <laughs> and I got him laughing. Once I got him laughing, I knew I had it. And he goes, well, I couldn't do it because I use leverage. I said, design one without leverage for the average person. He goes, well, you know, it wouldn't be perfect. I said, your idea of not perfect, they call him the Da Vinci of investing. Some call him the Steve Jobs of investing. I said, your idea of not perfect would be better than anybody on earth. I said, well, and then he said, let me think. And I felt this tingle down the back of my spine because I wasn't writing this book to make money. I was making this book so I could help people around the world. I watched people in 2008 lose their homes in mass, lose every, half of what they had, and that wasn't a statistic. That's how I grew up. So I wanted the answer. And he starts laying this, he goes, well, let's do this. And he gives me this exact formula, which he's never revealed ever in his entire history. I was shaking inside. And he goes, go test that. Go hire someone to test it. And back testing, he goes, back testing doesn't mean anything. You know, past performance doesn't equal future performance because people usually do it over three or four, five or 10 years. Do it over the entire modern year of investing, 75 years, and see how it did. Now think about all the ups and downs in the last 10 or 15 years. 2000 dropped 50%, 2008, 50%. And everybody's waiting for what's gonna happen next. And over all world wars, all that went on. We went and tested, I hired two different firms. One guy called me 11.30 at night. He's never called me 11.30 at night. He goes, Tony, Tony, I gotta talk to you. I said, what happened? He goes, in the last 75 years, this made money 85% of the time. And when it lost money 15% of the time, when it made money, it averaged 10%. When it lost money, the worst loss was 2008, and it was a loss of 3.9%. When everyone's losing 50, that's all he lost. If you could go to Vegas and be right 85% of the time, make 10%, and with the few times you lost, you'd only lose less than 4%, how would he be going to Vegas on a daily basis? So I put that in the book. By the way, all my partners and friends are like, let's make this into a company. Let's, I said, no. This is anybody can do it. And I just gave it to you so you can do it too. And I'll tell you why I gave it to you also. Because this last January, do you remember where the markets were? We have the worst January in the history of the stock market. Two trillion dollars disappeared. How fast, my friends? In a matter of like 10 days. And everybody, all the rich people and all the successful people in business, including this gentleman over here, they're all in Davos. And so everybody's freaking out. The market dropped like 600 points in the middle of the day. And people are like, well, is this the end? Are we finally seeing the end? And they went to who they go to in Davos. They brought in Ray, 
And he walks up to Dalio and they said, what should people do? And Ray's a very quiet, calm guy. He goes, well, Tony Robbins wrote a book where I gave him my formula. <laughs> and he literally said that and described it. And if you'd done what he did, when the market was down, for example, in the very first month down 10% and people are freaking out, it was up 1%. Right now, as of two days ago, I don't know what it is today, I didn't look, but as of two days ago, the market was 7.8%. This is up 12, in a 12.21. It's 47% greater than the market. And you do it once a year. You adjust it once a year. Now, I'm not telling you put all your money in there. I just want you to know there's a science to achievement. And that's true of finance. That's true of your body. That's true of a lot of things. And by one more thing I'll tell you. I have a partnership now with the number one rated firm. I'll throw it up on the screen for you if you're interested. Gentleman who was rated number one wealth manager three years in a row by Barron's. No one's done that in history. It's called creative planning. And the last two years, he's been number one wealth manager in America by CNBC. We have 20 billion in assets. I'm on the board of directors. I'm also the chief investor psychology and I'm Peter's partner. So if you go there, I benefit so you know. But I want you to know, if you want to get a second opinion, he'll do it for you for free. And the reason he's rated number one is most wealthy people have what's called a home office where they have a group of people, not somebody just selling you a product. You have somebody who's a fiduciary. It means legally they have to put your needs ahead of their own. If they told you to buy Apple this morning and they buy it this afternoon cheaper, they have to give you their stock. Peter's number one in that area. So if you want, you can go to getasecondopinion.com. That's my commercial for you. But he'd do a review for you. And you can implement it yourself or you can work with him. But the level of detail he does is amazing. So I gave you the book. So if you want to take care of that in your life, you can. But my larger point is simple. There's a science to achievement. And the science of achievement can get you from where you are to where you want in anything. And the way you speed it up is you find who's most successful and you model them. Write down this. Success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. If someone is able to succeed year after year after year, like Adalio, like, you know, Peter at Creative Planning, then perhaps they're not just lucky and you might want to find out what they're doing and avail yourself of it because you can press decades into days. You can have trial and error learning or you can go to someone's already figured it out and say, how do I do this and save yourself that time? I'm here today because my whole life has been modeling people so I could achieve more. But here's why I came this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever the hell it is now. I came here because my deeper mission is for you to master the second key to an extraordinary life. And it's the one our culture values a lot less. And it's a hell of a lot more important. And when I tell you, you're not going to be impressed. You're going to go, that's it? Because that's the way we're trained to think. The second master lesson to an extraordinary life is the art of fulfillment. The art, jot it down, of fulfillment. What do I mean by the art of fulfillment? Success is a science. What do I do to succeed in business? There's a science. There's a set of rules. But what fulfills us is totally different. Look at this woman's glasses right here. Take a look at these glasses here. Can, you see these? Can we get a camera on these glasses? These are very special glasses. No, not me, her. There they are. There's the glasses. No, look towards the camera, where the hell that is. So she has got a very special idea of these glasses. You can't really tell they're still at an angle here. My point is, these glasses, what do you think of these glasses? I think they're awesome too. I don't see anybody else with glasses like you. That's right, because these fulfill her. Other people go, what are those crazy ass glasses she's wearing, right? <laughs> right? We're all different. I'll give you an example. Steve Wynn is one of my dearest friends and a, a, one of my clients, as I said earlier, built half of Las Vegas, right? Multi-billionaire, started with less than nothing. His dad went broke, had a $400 million debt. He left college to figure out how to pay that off, keep his family above ground, and now one of the richest men in the world and very brilliant guy. And I'm having these conversations with Steve, and I'm thinking to myself, I, I, he calls me, first of all, and he says, Tony, where are you? And I'm thinking, why is he asking that? And I said, I'm in Sun Valley, Idaho. We both have vacation homes there. He goes, I'm in Sun Valley, Idaho. He goes, guess what? I said, what? He goes, it's my birthday. Aren't you going to come see me? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, of course I'm going to come see you, Steve. I didn't know you're here, but of course, love to. He goes, Tony, really, I want you to come over because he said, I gave myself a birthday gift. There is a painting that I have coveted for, I can't remember the number of years, I think 18 years, I'm making it up, but almost two decades. And he goes, I've coveted it, I've wanted it. It finally came up for sale. And he said, I outbid everybody at Soft Babies for it. And he said, I paid $82 million for this painting. And I'm like, wow. So picture what you think an $82 million painting means to you. My picture was like a Rembrandt, something, you know, from, you know, that period at least, right? You know, just something gorgeous. I don't know, something religious, spiritual, something. And so I drive to his house and I got all this anticipation to see what this painting's gonna be like. Steve's such a wonderful human being, rugs me in, goes, Tom, come on, check this out. And he walks me in the room, and there on the wall is this painting. 
Put it up on the screen so people see it. <laughs> and I looked at it and I said, I paused. I held my breath for a moment. I said, Steve, I thought it was like the emperor's new clothes. I said, dude, it's a red orange square. <laughs> He's, no, no, it's a Rothko. I said, I know, but it's a red orange square, $82 million. I said, dude, give me a hundred bucks in an hour. I can do this shit. I promise you. <laughs> he didn't like that. I got him laughing, right? You know, but here's why I tell you the story. Because what will excite you and fulfill you will be different than this person, even if that's your son, different than this person, different than you. Even though we may love each other, what fulfills us is not a science. It's an art. And if you don't know what's going to fulfill you, what are you doing all this for? How many people do you know that achieved their ultimate goal? Have you ever done this? Ever achieved a goal and then your brain went, is this all there is? Who here has ever had this moment? Raise your hand. Say, I. Isn't that moment worse than failing? Because most of us in this room, if you fail, you don't fail. What do you do? You get up and just what? Try something else. You're going to keep persisting till you find it, right? But if you succeed and you're unhappy, now you're what I call technically screwed, <laughs> right? I mean, it's the worst feeling in the world because you're just not fulfilled. So every one of us needs something different to have that sense of fulfillment. But I can tell you two things that we all need to be fulfilled as principles, not as rules. Number one, we must grow. If you don't grow, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how many Academy Awards you have. It doesn't matter how many people respect you. It doesn't matter if you have four perfect children. It doesn't matter if you have so much love, you're not going to feel it. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say, I. So if we don't grow, we what? You grow or you die. If you don't grow your business, it's dying. If, you don't, if your relationship's not growing, it's dying. There's no plateau. Who's with me on this here? Raise your hand. Say, I. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. I feel like we lost in this country a national treasure a little bit more than two years ago. I'm talking about Robin Williams. How many of you in this room, I want you to raise your hand, not if you liked Robin Williams. Raise your hand if you loved this man. Raise your hand if you loved him. Keep your hand up nice and high if you would. Keep your hand and look at the number of people that love this man. It's 98% of the room. There's only 2% assholes in this room that didn't like Robin Williams. <laughs> I've asked this question this year in Sydney, Australia, in Tokyo, in uh, Beijing, China, in uh, South America, in Peru. I've been all over the world. I've did 16 countries this year. Every place I've asked, every place I've gone, and every language being translated, on average, 98% of people raise their hand saying they loved him. And I always say, don't raise your hand if you liked him. Now, here's my question about this incredible soul, Robin. Was he a master of the science of achievement? Yes or no? Yes or no? He had a dream to go to Hollywood and do his own TV program. How many people have that dream and how many actually get it? He did it. He had a dream to not only have his own TV show, but he was going to make it number one. And some of you are ancient enough like me to actually remember that show. What was it called? Mork and Mindy. Some of you, it's replayed enough. You still know about it, right? Number one show. Then he said, I want to have the most beautiful family. And he did it. Achieved it. Then he said, I want more money than I could ever spend. And he achieved it. Then he said, I want to make movies. And he did it. Then he said, I want to make movies. And I want to make movies. I want to win an Academy Award. Watch this. For not being funny. His primary skill. And he won an Academy Award for drama. For dramatic performance. He did all of that. And then he hung himself. How do you explain that? Now some people say, well, he had Parkinson's, he had this, he had that. He suffered his whole life. He used alcohol, he used cocaine, he used everything he could get his hands on because he made everybody happy except whom? Himself. And he left a beautiful bride, wife, and children who loved him, and hundreds of millions, maybe a billion, I don't know the real number, I can only tell you anecdotally, Every country I've been in, 98% of the people translated in those countries tell me they loved him, and it wasn't enough. Yes, he had Parkinson's later, he had Lou, Lou, what are they called, Louis bodies in his brain, but he suffered his whole life because he suffered because he made everyone happy. He never mastered the art of fulfillment. He thought it was all about the science of achievement. That's why I came by today, because you guys are masters of achievement or you wouldn't be in a room like this. And I know there's different levels of achievement, but it's all relative, right? 
If you're in a room like this, you're hungry, you're driven, you're some of the best, you came here because you want more. You don't settle like most people. But I'd hate to have you wake up someday. I know you're not gonna hang yourself, but to have that emotion of feeling like life is not the richest experience that it could be, and it's only because you were so driven by the cultural conditioning of achievement. And I'm not suggesting don't achieve. I achieve, but I also am fulfilled. And I know people that are so fulfilled. This little character over here is massively fulfilled because he knows it isn't just achievement. It's really about something bigger. He's got a mission. He's got a sense of meaning. He knows what fulfills him, and he lives it. Richard Branson is one of the most fulfilled human beings you're gonna meet. It isn't because he's a multi-billionaire. He's an achievement, but his great benefit is he's fulfilled. I can't name a dozen people I've met, and I've met 10 million people, 50 million I've worked with, but 10 million people I've had these deep relationships with, and at least 50 multi-billionaires, and I couldn't name more than a half dozen that I could tell you honestly are really, truly fulfilled by their own description without bullshit. It ain't money that's gonna do it for you. It's not achievement that's gonna do it for you. So the best time to wake up will be now. And so this experience is what my life's work is, is to get people to experience the joy while you're here. And if you'd asked me a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, was I living that? I'd say, of course I am. And I would have believed that 100% I was. I've had the most amazing life. I have a woman as my wife who I would die for, been together 17 years, I'm not, Blowing the smoke, this woman is the greatest thing that ever happened to my wife. And it, it gives me, if I had nothing else in my life, I have four amazing children, I have three grandchildren, I've got 31 companies, I got a thousand employees, I'm in all these industries, I get to do what I want, when I want, at the level I want, I have financial freedom, all those things, and I come from nothing, so I'm proud, I did achieve, but more importantly, because it's been meaningful the way I've done, I felt fulfilled. That's why I'm here, I don't need to be here. I didn't come here for money, I didn't come here for a talk, I didn't come here to pump you up. How do we create that fulfillment? Here's what I found out. I've always talked about, even as I started this morning, this afternoon, when we talked about high energy, right? Energy rich. By the way, financially poor is not as bad as energy poor. You low in energy, everything's gonna break down. Your relationship's gonna break down. How are you gonna have passion when you're exhausted all the time? You might love each other, but you're not gonna have real passion. How are you gonna be a great parent when you're exhausted all the time? How are you gonna create breakthroughs when you're making it through the day? And what sucks the energy out of us is not food or sleep. We can do with those things. They're important, we can do without them at times if we have to. It's lack of meaning. And we're ending a world that's about to disrupt itself massively because the very technology we're creating is gonna disrupt, according to Oxford, 40% of all jobs over the next 15 to 18, 20 years. What are we gonna do in four or five years when there's three million truck drivers in this country and Ford just announced in four years they'll have self-driving trucks. Why would I hire someone who can only work eight hours legally because I gotta give them rest when I can have a truck that'll do 24 hours and it doesn't crash and it doesn't get drunk and it doesn't give me shit and attitude. And I can depreciate it. And that technology will get better and better geometrically. And no one is preparing those truck drivers. We're gonna have a massive disruption in our culture. So maybe what we really gotta do is really decide how to make sure we find ecstasy in this moment right now. Because whatever challenges are, let me tell you something. Problems and happiness have no relationship. Can you have huge problems and still be totally happy? Yes or no? Come on guys, yes or no? But our brain, the mind won't tell you that. You're more than your mind. You got a heart, you got a soul, you got a spirit, but most of us, because of technology, have gone more and more here. And this is a great tool, the mind. But you gotta train it to do what you want. Some people have seen, any of you seen my documentary, uh, um, I'm Not Your Guru, did anybody see it by chance? Awesome. You know, one of the things people ask me about is, why do you jump in that 56 degree water every day? Are you insane? And I do it because it's a discipline where I've trained my mind, when I tell it what to do, we don't negotiate. I don't let my mind run me. I let my heart and soul run me. And I've trained this brain to use, to use it when I need it for strategy, for tools. But your mind will never make you happy. Only your heart will. Your mind won't even allow you to enjoy an apple. If you drive the apple, it's gonna go, is it organic? <laughs> Where'd it come from? Where do I put it? Where do I throw it away? The mind is just, how many know what I'm talking about here? Say I. So, one of the pieces that will shift things for you is, instead of energy rich or energy poor, high energy or low energy, I was in India with a dear friend of mine named Krishna Jay, and he said, Tony, what if you switched those words and just called it beautiful states, high energy states, 
and low energy states are suffering states. I said, well, that, I think that would be an accurate description. He goes, well, then let me tell you what my spiritual vision is. I said, okay, tell me your spiritual vision. He said, to live in a beautiful state every day, no matter what, even when it doesn't go my way because life is too short to suffer. Who believes that, by the way? Say, I. I, I was intrigued. I said, he said, why? He said, why, why do you call that your spiritual vision? He goes, because when I'm in a beautiful state, I don't have to think about how to treat other people. I always do the right thing. And when I'm in a suffering state, even though I'm a good human being, I treat people poorly. So let's talk about it for a moment. If I asked you one of the greatest experiences of your life, what was it? A moment. I'm sure you've had many. Pick one. What's been one of the most beautiful, magical, magnificent, sacred, sexy, sensual, loving, meaningful experiences of your life? Just one of them. I know you've got plenty. If we went through that, you could tell me the story, but I'm out of time, so you can't tell me the story. <laughs> But if you told me the story and we did this for a while, which I've done with people before, you'll always see the same pattern. The pattern of what makes you most alive is things that give you these emotions you want most. Beautiful states like love or joy or gratitude or excitement or hunger or drive or creativity. See, you don't just have happiness. If it's only one state you're going after, your brain needs variety. Ever, you know, ever been so happy you smile so much your face hurt? <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about here? So we need lots of beautiful states. But here's what I can tell you. When you're in a beautiful state, everything goes. Now, what's a suffering state? I don't, I don't think anyone in this room, I could be wrong. I sure know if you would ask me a year and a half ago, do I suffer? I would have laughed. Suffer? Are you kidding? You see my wife? See my wife? See what I got to do? See who my friends are? I have the most magnificent life. And I wouldn't be even being phony. I was being totally authentic. It's just, just like achievers aren't fearful, they get stressed. No achiever suffers, but they do. Because it's not consistent, that word is not consistent with our identity, is it? But what if suffering was any state that takes you out of your heart and soul and makes you feel fulfilled, like frustration, anger, overwhelm, stress, worry, concern? And by the way, I would get pissed off and frustrated, but I would say to myself, that's not suffering, that's part of life. That's what I believe, and whatever you believe, you'll live. And I then began to realize, no, it's not. Suffering states are the result of the brain. We have a two million year old brain in our bodies and it's designed not to make you happy. It's designed to make you survive. And that's what almost everybody does, they survive. Happiness is your job. And I just come by to remind you how you can do it and have it be sustained if you wanna know who's interested. If you wanna be happy, here's my question first. How many of you in this room want to be happy for the rest of your life? no matter what. Let me ask you a second question. How many are not just wanting it, are totally committed to be happy every single day for the rest of your life? You say that now. The only way you can have that is if you make the connection that problems and happiness have no relationship. How many of you know somebody who has a life you'd love to have and they're still pissed off or worried or concerned or freaked out? Raise your hand. Right? You go, if I was there, I wouldn't feel that way. Bullshit. Because the mind is always looking for something. Because this two million year old brain is basically survival software. And what it's doing is always looking for what's wrong. And whatever you look for, you'll find. Try this for a second. Look around this room and look for everything that is brown. As fast as you can, I'm going to test you. Look around anywhere. Anything that's brown. Brown clothing, brown people, brown anything. Look for it. Look for brown, look for brown, I'm gonna test you. Look behind you, don't miss anything that's brown. Look for brown, look for brown. Close your eyes. Tell me everything you just saw that was red. <laughs> Raise your hand if you saw a lot more brown than red. Raise your hand, say aye. Open your eyes, look for red now. Look for red, look for red, everywhere. Look for red, anywhere you can find it. Look for red, look for red. Raise your hand if you found a lot more red this time and say aye. Why did you find more red this time? Because in an old book called The Good Book, it says, seek and ye shall. In fact, seek and ye shall find. Whatever you look for, you're going to find, even if it's not there. I'll prove it to you. How many saw beige shit called it brown just to feel successful? <laughs> How many saw burgundy and called it red just so you could get bigger points? If you think someone's a jerk, will you find jerkiness in them? Even if it's not there, won't you shade it? Yes or no? If you think they're a good person, will you find goodness in them? Yes or no? If you think you're a jerk, will you make yourself in a jerk by finding some part of yourself? Yes or no? So we get what we look for. 
The brain is looking for what's wrong. Remember this as long as you live. What's wrong is always available. So is what's right. It's all a matter where you go. And this brain, survival software, is looking for what's wrong so it can fight it or flight it. But there's one problem. We don't have a saber-toothed tire to run from anymore. So now it makes up things like, oh my God, what are people thinking of me? So I better shade the picture that I put on Instagram so I really come across even better. Or do I have enough money in a country here in the United States, for example, where the poorest of the poor, and I, I, you know I'm focused to help the poor. I was the poor. But if you're in poverty in the United States, or you're one of those people marching saying those 99, we're 99 percenters, those 1 percent jerk offs, they don't care about anybody, you're lying when you do that, because you're the 1 percent of the world. If you're in poverty in the United States, you're the 1 percent of wealth in the world. But conveniently, you're not thinking about those people, only about yourself. And the reason is, write this down, suffering always comes from an obsession with yourself. Suffering disappears when you're trying to give or focus or share beyond yourself. When you obsess, not when you take care of yourself, we've got to take care of ourselves, but when you obsess about yourself, it's there. A woman says to me, no, it's not, I'm not obsessed about myself, I'm obsessed about my children. My children, I'm so worried, they're not doing well, they're, they're, one of them's on drugs. And I said, yes, but the real reason you're suffering is because you feel you failed them. If you ever look at when you continuously suffer, it's because you're focused on yourself. Raise your hand if you can see this, right? You think about the thoughts, what you're not getting, what you're not experiencing, what you're not finding. And what's interesting is when we're inside our own head about ourselves, we're in that survival software, and we go into this scarcity that freaks us out, and we don't treat people well. Somebody asked me just recently, they said, how do you explain what kind of person could do what we saw in Nice, we saw in Paris, we saw in San Bernardino, we saw in Orlando, like go in some place and kill other human beings, men, women, and children. They don't even know, cold-blooded murder. I said, I can't tell you who did it, but I can tell you who didn't do it. It wasn't a fulfilled person. It wasn't a happy human being. Happy human beings, fulfilled human beings, human beings in beautiful states don't try to hurt other people. They don't try to steal from other people. They don't try to tear other people down. They don't write shit about them on the web. And they sure as hell don't kill people, plant bombs, or shoot people with bullets. It takes a really disturbed person to do that. And you know what? Most people are disturbed at times because the mind will make you disturbed even though you're not. Because it's a device. It's gonna fight or it's gonna flight. And if you let this run your life, you go to sleep, you're gonna have the pain that all of us feel at times. But I came by today to remind you that you're in charge and that you can change it with just a couple of distinctions. And what are those distinctions? Number one, you have to first identify that you do suffer even though you would never say that. I would never say I'd suffered. I'd say, well, of course I get pissed off and frustrated, but that's such a minority of my time. Is any moment worth suffering over in this life? And when you're suffering, by the way, suffering begets more suffering. Is it true? When you're suffering, do you affect other people? Even if you don't try to hurt them to say something, do they feel it? Do your kids, does your husband, does your wife, do your coworkers feel when you're suffering, yes or no? So you're stealing from that energy and it's simply because you didn't do the following steps. Here they are. Want to know them? Here they are. One, you got to identify your favorite flavor of suffering. Because we all have one. Is yours worry? Is it pissed off? Is it concern? Is it feeling less than? Feeling not enough? What is your favorite flavor of suffering? What is the emotion that puts you in a state that's unresourceful? And when you're unresourceful, it's hard to solve it, isn't it? You might say, but I want to just go solve this. You can solve your problem so much faster in a resourceful state, in a beautiful state, than a problem state. Because when you're not hooked, you can get through to people. But when you're hooked, people feel that, and they don't know how to react to it. And it fires off their suffering. And people, they unconsciously start to not connect. And then we end up with that disengagement that at the lowest level shows up in business, and at the most important level shows up in your intimate life with those you love. And so if we want to change it, you got to discover. So what, if I asked you right now, Young lady with the glasses, you stand out so nicely. What's your favorite flavor of suffering? That I'm not enough. What's your favorite flavor of suffering, sir? Not being recognized. Well, shit, you just got from 10 million people across the web, and yeah, you're doing good. You shine your head up, give you a little kiss with that. You're, you're, you're acknowledged now, right? Okay? What is your most favorite flavor of suffering? Worry, right? Mine was frustration. You know what I found out? I realized my happiness was so cheap. All it took was this for me to become unhappy. Because remember I told you, I got 31 companies, seven different you know, areas, different types of businesses, 
all around the world, 1,000 employees. I got a question for you. What are the chances of somebody screwing something up right now with that many companies all around the world on three continents, 1,000 plus people? What are the chances of somebody messing something up right now? What are the chances? Tell me quick. 100%. And all I need is to have this nearby. And look at it. There's one right there. There's a text. I can see it. Somebody's messed something up. And what has messed something up? What did it take for me to lose my happiness? Someone not to do what I think they should do ideally now. And the more people you care about and the more people you interact, the more the greatest chance that this is going to be happening all the time. So I'd find myself happy, happy, happy. Ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, that's where I go. Oh, man. I'd use a different word. F, you know, something, you know. When I was really suffering, I'd go into a different language. Who knows what I'm, who, who uses different language when you're suffering? Let me see a show of hands here. Right? Part of you know you're suffering by the language you use. And so I began to realize I'm giving up my happiness over this. If in order for you to be happy, everybody's got to do what you think they should do, you're never going to sustain happiness. I would love for you to be happy the rest of your life. I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how because I'm doing it. You have to decide what's your favorite way of suffering, and then you have to make the most important decision of your life. And I never would have said this before. I would have said the most important decision of your life, I believe in the past, is who you love. Who you spend time with is who you become. I still think that's one of the most important decisions of your life. But my wife and I both agree now. The most important decision is deciding not to suffer anymore, that life is too short, and that you're going to find joy, beautiful states in every moment, and you're committed to it even when it doesn't go your way even when it rains on your parade. See, I don't want you to ever feel pain if I could help it. I don't know you, but I hate suffering because I grew up suffering. I had four different fathers. I had a mother that loved me, but she would beat the hell out of me. She put liquid soap down my throat until I threw up because she thought I was lying and I wasn't. I mean, it was crazy stuff. But if she'd been the mother I wanted, I would not be the man I'm proud to be. Because I, I wouldn't have this drive. Why would I be here? Why would I go feed a billion people? Why would I do the things I'm doing? So you know what? Sometimes not getting what you want is what makes you into something that's got something more to give. So if you make this decision, I don't want you to ever have pain if I could help it, but I can't. So that means you make the decision, I'm going to be happy even if someone I love dies. Because what good is it for you to live in suffering when they die? Would they want that? But we have cultural conditioning that makes us think that we're supposed to do this. And so many people think suffering is a positive emotion or it's noble. Suffering people don't inspire others. They don't lift others. See, while you're suffering, you're not there for the other people that don't understand what you know, who are crying, that are hurting, and you could be comforting. But you can't do it when you're suffering. You're inside of you. Who understands what I'm talking about here? Say, I. So if you make the decision, when I say a decision, most people's idea of decision, they state a preference. I've decided I'm going to do this, but they aren't committed. If you're totally committed, what do you do? I always tell people, if you want to take the island, burn the boats. Because as long as there's a way out, our brains will take it.